Hello, hello, hello everyone. And uh, now it's time for our side side event. I think a lot of people will come soon. I hope so. But good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone from Japan Pavilion and everyone participating via Zoom. Uh, it's my honor to welcome you to Japan Pavilion side event, Climate Resilient Development Pathway, Addressing Climate Change and Sustainable Development uh, in this special setting. My name is Taiji Watanabe uh, from Global Environment Department of JICA and will be your MC for today. Uh, this side event will bring together key stakeholders to foster dialogue, share knowledge, discuss uh, holistic approaches and future challenges in promoting climate resilient development, uh, while also examining the linkage of climate actions and sustainable development goals. Uh, here. Before we start the, the session, I would like to make a short housekeeping announcement. Uh, first, this event will be streamed and recorded via Zoom for who are uh, for the ones participating uh, via Zoom. Please refrain from recording and kindly keep your video and your microphone muted. And your cooperation is highly appreciated. Uh, this is all for a housekeeping, and we are now going to start our event. Uh, for the beginning of the event, I'm pleased to introduce Ms. Masako Ogawa, from, uh, Deputy Director General of Environmental uh, Bureau, Ministry of Environment of Japan, for the opening remarks. Uh, Ms. Ogawa, the, the floor is yours. Distinguished uh, speakers, uh, Ms. Ofa Kaisumi from Pacific Climate Change, actually my, my former boss, and uh, Dr. Hu Quan Long from Vietnam Ministry of Natural Resources and uh, Environment, and uh, Ms. Akihiro Miyazaki from JICA, and also Dr. Nancy uh, Van Dyke from Brown Bank. Uh, distinguished guest uh, speakers, thank you so much for participating. Uh, my name is Masako Oga, Deputy Director General of the Global Environment Bureau, Ministry of Environment Japan. Uh, on behalf of the Japanese government, I would like to extend my warmest greeting and welcome everyone here today. Uh, I'd like to uh, express my sincere gratitude to the uh, honorable panelists and for the discussion session. So before I begin uh, the discussion, I would like to say some words. So this event uh, focus on uh, climate resilience development and uh, holistic approaches for climate resilience and uh, sustainable future. So we are all facing growing impacts of climate change, also dealing multiple challenges to achieve the sustainable development goals, uh, particularly eradicating poverty and securing food and water security and public health. Uh, in this context, integrate holistic and inclusive approaches are required to achieve the uh, global goals, especially for countries that are vulnerable to the adverse impact of uh, climate change. Then the climate resilience, uh, resilient development or CD CRD uh, highlighted by IPCC sixth assessment report is a process of implementing climate change mitigation and adaptation while promoting sustainable development for all in ways that support human and uh, planetary health, as well as well-being, equity, and justice. So the government of Japan is promoting CRD with various partners. For example, uh, JICA, uh, JICA uh, today presented, uh, promoting its global, uh, sorry, formulated its global agenda for climate change in June 2021 to promote CRD, particularly through the co-benefit approach. And this approach to climate change aims to achieve multiple development objectives, including energy, transport, disaster risk reduction, agriculture, water, and so forth, while addressing climate change effectively. So in this event, our distinguished uh, speakers will share their knowledge and uh, uh, experiences and discuss how to realize holistic approaches bridging uh, climate action and SDGs, as well as challenge, challenges in promoting CRD, including synergies and trade-offs. 
So I hope uh, uh, information discussion will be uh, useful for all, all the participants and also uh, provide some ideas for you to uh, for your uh, kind of the solution uh, through CRD and uh, uh, and also to uh, achieve a sustainable and resilient society uh, for all. So thank you very much and uh, look forward to a uh, fruitful discussion and uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mizoga, for these encouraging remarks. And we are going to move forward now for the uh, substantive uh, session. As for this first session, Mr. Akihiro uh, Miyazaki, Deputy Director General of Global Environment Department of JICA, will introduce about JICA's effort to respond to climate resilient development. Mr. Miyazaki, the floor is yours. Hi, Minasan, Konnichiwa. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Moshi, Kotino Hodemo, Ana Ojikanti, Yoroshikatara, Zehi, Goran Nategrasai. Hi. Hi, good afternoon. So, actually, that uh, uh, today, so I will show you that uh, so effort to promote the climate resilience development at done by JICA. Uh, you know, that the uh, global warming to ending. And so Ella or the global at the boiling it alive. It said that the uh, at, uh, at the UN said actually that the heat wave, uh, sea level rising, drought, heavy rain, and flood. We should enhance the climate resilience development. On the other hand, uh, SDG point of view. So we have still it's a bunch of that uh, development challenges, poverty, gender equality, education, food, water, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. How to tackle on that uh, at the climate resilience development? Today, so I will tell you how to move on and achieve that the climate resilience development. Uh, we JICA set the 20 so global agenda. Climate change is a one of the important uh, agenda. The uh, global agenda contribute to the, the goal of the UNFCC and sustainable and resilient society. We set two approach set up in global agenda. First approach, promote implementation of the, the Paris Agreement. First approach is more like focus on the, the capacity development in developing country, natural, uh, national and local and action plan, institutional and implementation capacity, strengthen GHG emission inventory, transparency framework and process of NDC. And the second approach is co-benefit of climate change. JICA co-benefit approach to climate change refer to a solution that aim to achieve sustainable development while also provide co-benefit with adaptation and mitigation in order to contribute to climate resilience development. These measures also aim to maximize the synergy and minimize the potential trade-off with sustainable development. In addition to that, considering that the natural environment and biodiversity. So this is so our JICA for benefit uh, approach to the, the climate change. So I I will show you that uh, at the overview of the uh, our approach and the framework to the, the climate resilience development. 
it's a nice animation, right? <laughs> so, so we call the, the JCCRS, JICA co benefit approach to climate change for climate resilience and sustainable development. And I'm telling you the something in deep in detail. JICA set the 20 global agenda based on the four pillar, prosperity, people, peace, and planet. All our cooperation is closely linked to the, the climate change. To make outcome of the, the global development challenges, we can utilize our scheme, technical co cooperation, loan, and grant aid. The projects are delivered to finance, technology, and capacity development according to the, the partnered country strategy and priority. While conducting our cooperation, try to maximize the synergy and minimize the trade-off. If we successfully conduct the project capacity development, finance for the, the strategy and policy formulation, we are making that the plan do check and action. Plan mean that the, at the policy formulation, do is implementation of the project, and the check, evaluation, and the monitoring. Action mean that the improve the result and circulating that the plan do check action, plan do check and action. We push more in the, the, the CDR gear. We need push more and put more in technology, innovation, and social and political will, and also that the international cooperation. CRD gear, get more energy and get more speed with such at the international cooperation and some other at the function. Spinning the strongly, we provide the win to get more finance, GHG reduction, and finally achieve that the religious at the development and the society. And also that the targeting that the low risk, low carbon, and equity and justice, ecosystem health, low poverty and well-being. Yes, this is our JCCRS, JICA co-benefit approach to climate change for climate resilience and sustainable development. And we set up the, the organizational indicator, output and outcome. So output indicator, so we have set up the, some several indicator for million CO2 uh, ton per year, the GHG emission reduction and doubling the, the contribution to the climate change adapt, adaptation, finance, climate change, the project worth one trillion yen per year, and also that the promotion of the sustainable at the development. As I mentioned, the maximize the synergy and minimize and trade off. Say easy, but conducting the not so easy. That's why that uh, we analyze, made the survey in our company. So this illustration show that uh, a correlation between synergy and trade and our 20 global agenda. Green mean, so our global agenda get the synergy with SDG goal. And the yellow mean that the GA, uh, the each GA global agenda get synergy and trade-off. For example, that the, at the environmental management at the third from the bottom, 
So we actually that I also managing that uh, environmental management. Environmental management means that the solid waste management and air and water pollution. Actually, that the uh, uh, environmental management very much target on that the uh, SDG three, six, and uh, eleven, twelve, and fourteen. However, it, uh, we can see that uh, some yellow mark. Yellow mark means that uh, some trade off and synergy. Yeah, that's why that we are able to overcome that the trade off utilizing that the, our guideline. Also, that uh, some countermeasure at avoiding that the trade off. And coming to the one uh, concrete example in a disaster risk and the reduction, the flood control in Manila, Philippines. Manila, Philippines, that was face, facing the, the challenge, flood control, once hit by the, the storm, rain, or typhoon, they are losing the, the human life and property. And also that the, some negative, huge impact on the, the national budget. That's why that the government of Philippines request that the, our cooperation, we receive the, some request with the policy is uh, built back better. And we provide a technical cooperation and loan project, such as uh, some at the river channel with the improvement, and also that the grant aid. Uh, it, this it combined to response integrated to climate risk, such as uh, weather forecasting, disaster prevention, and risk reduction, utilizing that the uh, at uh, some at the great uh, system, the global uh, climate model, downscaling more in the Manila area, and we can get some concrete uh, project with a uh, uh, disaster risk reduction project. Unfortunately, that the year twenty twenty. So hit by that the big typhoon, it said that the uh, Ulysses. And fortunately that the uh, already project that completed, that's why that uh, already set up that infrastructure, also that the uh, early warning system in Manila, Philippines. Yeah, that's why that uh, we minimize that the negative impact and also that uh, some damage on that uh, such uh, infrastructure and early warning system. This is somehow that a complete at the project idea for the future. However, that uh, this project also that uh, some huge synergy, like uh, increased resilience, reduction poverty, improve health, and DGS city, and improve sanitation. And also that uh, it, it was something that the negative impact, like a positive, uh, no, pos potential as a trade-off. We try to minimize such uh, trade-off using the, the, the guideline or countermeasure to minimize or overcome that trade-off. This is final page. I guess now you are able to understand at the uh, JCCRS, JICA co-benefit approach to the climate change for climate resilience and sustainable development. This contribute CRD, climate resilience development and SDG. We can overcome the challenges and find a way to maximizing the synergy and minimizing the trade-off. JICA, so we can be a main driver to achieve the CRD and make corrective action, considering the holistic and inter integrated approach. 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Miyazaki. Uh, I think your presentation was very uh, helpful to understand the new approach on, on JICA, co-benefit approach of climate change. Here we have a QR code of our uh, policy briefing draft. If you want to, to download, you can download from that QR code. We have a paper base as well. If you want it, you can take a picture for them as well. So now we are going to pass to the next uh, this uh, session of this this event. Now we are going to move to the discussion section and I would like to ask for the panelists to, to come to the stage and also Mr. Kato, our moderator, uh, to the, and you know, the, the, will uh, moderate this session, please. Thank you very much. And for the mic, we have a little bit button there. When you use it, you need to press a little bit until it get red. Yes. Thank you very much, Mr. Kato. The floor is yours. Okay. Um, uh, good afternoon, uh, friends and colleagues. So welcome to the JICA side event uh, at the Japan Pavilion. Um, and this is a very uh, important uh, discussion for us um, to uh, explore our new um, um, approach uh, that was uh, just uh, presented uh, by uh, Mr. Miyazaki. Um, I think that uh, today uh, well, it's a uh, um, outside of the um, the this room. Well, uh, the main uh, negotiation room. Well, well there are um, really high level uh, people, uh, including our prime ministers. But um, I think that, uh, also uh, it is good to um, explore our, our own um, um, activities on the ground for, um, here in this um, Japan Pavilion. My, my name is Makoto Kato. Um, I am um, a general manager, um, um, a member of board of directors of the Overseas Environmental Cooperation Center Japan. So I'm happy to uh, uh, take the role of the um, um, moderator in this session. Um, before um, starting, I would like to um, pass my microphone to, uh, to, to my colleagues for to briefly introduce the, um, your name and your affiliation and your, your background for uh, especially uh, your, your working experience uh, with uh, JICA. Yes. Thank you very much for the invitation. My name is Dr. Nancy Van Dijk. I'm with the World Bank in the Climate Change Group. Uh, and I have specifically focused over the last year uh, about Paris alignment and how to make sure that all development projects do actually deliver also on mitigation and adaptation. Hello. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Lu Guanghui. Currently, that I'm working, uh, I'm responsible for GHG emission reduction and ozone layer protection under the Vietnam Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment. So, in the past 15 years, I've been uh, responsible for developing legally binding documents uh, for the Vietnamese government uh, on GHG emission reduction and also other climate change related issues. Uh, for uh, we we have been uh, having a cooperation with. JICA and Japan in general since uh, 2015 with a series of projects. And currently we have one project with Katusang as well, uh, working on uh, improving the capacity for uh, my ministry and also my ministry and private sector on uh, achieving the NDC targets and also to us our net zero target as well. Yeah, thank you, very pleased to be here. Um, thank you, moderator. Um, excuse me, I bring warm greetings from uh, the Pacific, Maloilele Talofalava. My name is uh, Ofa Kaisami, and I'm the manager of the Pacific Climate Change Center. My affiliation with Chaika, Masako San is my colleague, my former colleague, and I manage the, I used to manage the capacity building um, project for building resilience in the Pacific, which was a technical cooperation through Chaika. Uh, from 2019 to 2023. And of course, there is a phase two of that capacity building, which I will manage starting from next year, looking more into innovation, uh, innovative solutions for climate resilience. That's my, um, my affiliation. But the big one is that the center, the Pacific Climate Change Center is actually an initiative, a bilateral between the government of Samoa and the government of Japan, officially opened in 2019. 
Um, so that's uh, that's me and the affiliation with um, with Chaika. Thank you. Thank you very much. And and Miyazaki san again. Um, yeah. Well, he's he's uh, joining us uh, as as also the panel discussion uh, today. So uh, we have a very uh, rich uh, uh, figures for um, uh, the series of figures for um, uh, in this uh, uh, session. So um, um, to kick off our um, um, uh, panel discussion, I would like to um, throw four different um, key questions uh, uh, to the panelists. Um, and of course, for the well, um, you have your own context so that the uh, you can you can frame um, this uh, these key questions for in your um, uh, discussion. Um, first, um, I would like to uh, 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 raise like uh, the questions. Uh, the panelists are um, expected uh, to provide your feedback and suggestion uh, for the improvement of uh, regarding what new um, definition and uh, operationalization of co-benefits of climate change approach. As um, just uh, Miyazaki-san uh, mentioned, for well, uh, they explained about for well, the new approach. And I think well, this is a great um, 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 effort for that, that, that JICA is now integrating for the um, climate um, sustainable development or in the context of um, climate resilience, um, resilient, resilient development. But I think uh, they, all of um, us um, here on the stage for um, um, our actions are related to this um, uh, new approach. So um, first, um, I would like to um, ask for the colleagues for to uh, respond, maybe well, like your suggestion, your reflection, and to what extent and how you may want to um, work uh, with uh, JICA uh, in this regard. Then second question, um, uh, how are uh, actually what well, the World Bank, the um, Pacific region, and also the government of Vietnam um, uh, trying to achieve CRD? So the CRD, as uh, Ogawa-san um, at the outset for mentioned, well, this is actually well, the, one of the things what well, we have featured for well, in the, um, I, the very recent IPCC uh, report. And I think on the uh, this is not a uh, completely new um, um, concept, but I think uh, the the reason why we're talking about climate resilient development in the context of um, this year and for the next um, five years or ten years. So perhaps for well, you may uh, want to uh, talk about for well, the um, your own um, approach, your relevant um, activities regarding um, climate resilient. Um, 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 development addressing both climate change and for well, sustainable development. The third one, uh, what do you think um, uh, is the important factors to promote well, the involvement of CRD uh, uh, and uh, uh, CRD stakeholders um, and also for co-creation? I think all the uh, it is not uh, uh, only the government's um, role, but it's it it's not only um, international development partners' role, but also it is extremely important to involve um, stakeholders. The engagement is um, extremely important. So, what do you think is the most important factor well, um, in your con in your context and also your experience? And then the final one um, is how can we avoid or minimize trade off? Uh, while pursuing climate benefit and sustainable development goals. I think, and um, of course, co-benefit is very important, but in the practice, um, actually what we uh, are faced with trade, trade off um, issues as well. So that is something where we, we should also um, explore how we're going to minimize and how we are going to maximize the benefit aspect. So maybe I, 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 I throw, so many questions to you, but um, for the sake of um, um, the discussion, I'm happy to um, start well with my colleagues. Maybe on um, Dr. Hui, um, yeah, you can start. Thank you very much, Gato san and uh, allow me to speak first because I have another commitment in uh, my pavilion in about 20 minutes. Um, first of all, that's a lot of questions, but interesting ones, and thank you very much for, for your presentation. And I think it's very meaningful that JICA is taking the approach for co-benefits on climate change, resilient development. And because that reminded me of what Vietnam has been working on since the past about 15 years. Uh, since 2018, uh, sorry, since 2008, 
we started to have the first document related to climate change, which is the National Target Program to Respond to Climate Change, NTPRCC for short. And we looked at the sustainable development goals and so how that would affect our other uh, development goals and, and objectives that we need to achieve. Because climate change by that time is considered as a very newly introduced challenge to Vietnam. And, and we were at the time that uh, considered as one of the most vulnerable countries in the world because of climate change impacts. So we're taking, we were taking uh, climate change adaptation very seriously and considering that we are countries uh, very, very much dependent on agriculture by that time and also the natural resources as well. So uh, since then that all the, our legal uh, framework around climate change would build upon sustainable development goals. And along with many different uh, decisions that's come out in an F2C and also the uh, different types of indicators on development and on climate change adaptation and mitigation from different organizations, for JICA, for example, and also the World Bank and OECD and so on and so forth. So we learn from the experience from, from different organizations to build uh, our legal uh, documents, our legal framework. Uh, and the core thing is still climate resilience or climate change adaptation, because we know that while well, that is a key thing that we need to take care of when it comes to climate change impacts uh, in Vietnam, because we're still very much vulnerable. And even now, currently, that we still have about 45% of our population very much dependent on agriculture and all, all types of nature-based livelihoods. So that is, is still our core of climate change uh, uh, response activities that we do. And it's reflected very well in our laws recently and because of climate change is integrated into our law environmental protection. So we have a dedicated chapter on, on climate change in which and climate resilient development and climate resilience, in, uh, climate change resilient, the terms in Vietnamese was repeatedly mentioned and uh, uh, was, was uh, developed into the, the, the regulations of Vietnam. So every single project has to take climate resilience at the core of its development and an approval process as well from the beginning. So that's one thing. And I am also very glad that you're taking every single uh, uh, objectives of the SDZ into the equation and into the matrix and looking at the co-benefits approach as well. And, and we're doing very similar things and not as detailed as you do, but very similar things. So we have a set of indicators um, uh, for, for sustainable development in Vietnam and for climate change, this has recently it's been developed in much more detail, including what would adaptation would bring to the people, to the, uh, to, to, to the community. And also the private sector and other stakeholders, when they do, uh, for example, um, the uh, GEG emission reduction measures, and what that would bring the co-benefits to the community that, that may affect uh, that. It's not legally binding yet, but it will be in very near future. It would first, at the moment, is, is it turn into the, the standard for, for, for the government to, 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 to follow. So every project that we do regarding climate change adaptation would follow that. I think that is very much similar to what you just explained uh, with some of the piloted projects as you have. So that, that probably to address the first question that we have a very similar thing, but that can be fine tuned in terms of, you know, not every project got a fair or got a, got a, a single formula for sustainable development or climate uh, resilient development. So we need to take um, stakeholder analysis very carefully and to analyze so how vulnerable they are and how effective they are to any types of activities that the projects would include uh, uh, to be able to find out what would be the best solution to for them. And in fact, uh, our uh, most recent um, cooperation with JICA, our SBI NDC project, which is an strengthening uh, the, the planning and implementation of our NDC that we're working with Kato Sang here and Fukuda Sang over there uh, in Vietnam well, with the help of JICA. We developed the NDC tracking indicators and that very much will be based on the SDZ and also the commitments that Vietnam has made for not only in terms of our GHG emission targets, but also the adaptation 
objectives that we do uh, within our NDC. And that would help along with the uh, requirement by UNFCCC uh, under you know, CMA uh, uh, 8 uh, decision that we develop the NDC tracking indicators that would help with every single project to follow that type of, of indicators. So very much similar to the indicators as you have in terms of co-benefits and many different types of co-benefits there. But and, and now to answer that, probably to answer the second question that how Vietnam would do it. But the third questions that I think that while well, Vietnam is taking that approach into a larger scale to upscale it. And one example is our uh, just energy transition partnership, the, the uh, JETP that we do. And in fact, we're having the launch of our resource mobilization today in two hours. And we taking the just part very seriously and in every single project that we require that they will have to make a very careful stakeholder analysis and how much um, that how 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 affected that community or even the people working in that industry would be affected even down to the point that how much that would cost them yeah to move to another work or to find another type of job and how they do the how that would cost to train them to to do other things so that that probably to answer the third questions and for the last question that is 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 very general sorry i need to take a look again to make sure that is it to minimize the trade offs Similarly, the trade-off is always there. And again, it's, 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 we can't really say that, well, for this type of projects that we have a similar trade-offs with the community. But for example, for our, under, under our JP, that we, we need to slowly face down our coal industry, then face out completely by 2040. And we got 300,000 people that are directly working in coal industry and about 1,200,000 people dependent on them so that but not all of them would have the similar uh, impacts because of the coal face out and coal face down so we need to very carefully uh, analyze what they do and where they are and what what would be the potential that they would move to another livelihoods and now how that would affect their lives so that is, is is what we do at the moment and but that requires a lot of, uh, of efforts from from the policy side and from the capacity building side and you know, from technical side as well. So that is what, what we do. And, and I will say that, well, it's hard, but well, if everybody uh, get their hands on, it, it would be possible. So that a little bit my sharing there, and I'm happy to answer any question that you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, Dr. Hui actually will um, agree to stay uh, with us for, for 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 this question, but but uh, his his prime minister is around, and then he uh, he's actually will uh, need to return to um his his pavilion, which is three minutes away from here. But uh, yeah, um now now the um the government of Vietnam is uh, taking another for well, extra step uh to to elevate for this climate actions so, uh, and and through well jet B. So um I really appreciate for Dr. Hui's well, um, response. Thank you very much. Yep. Yep. Okay. Okay. Then I am going to um, squeeze a little bit <laughs> together. Um, thank you uh, very much, Dr. Hui. And then I would like to invite for um, Nancy to respond for to 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 the questions as you as you like. Thank you very much. Um, yes, um, I'm happy that the, the the previous speaker talked about jet peas, and I can certainly also comment on that. Uh, first, let me uh, applaud uh, Jika's efforts and uh, your approach is really welcome and it's actually very healthy uh, to talk about trade-offs. And let me explain a little bit more. Fundamentally, what we are all trying to do as development partners, Jika, World Bank and others, is really helping countries develop while at the same time making sure that this development is climate friendly. And so that ambition is actually very ambitious. And uh, on the World Bank side, we have been working for many years on ways we can reconcile those uh, objectives. So talking about trade-offs, I think is quite healthy. I would say, and I very much actually welcome your paper and read it with great interest. I liked very much your table highlighting 
uh, areas where there are synergies and trade-off, I would just say from that perspective that it's very country specific. So it's very good to have a, a broad picture uh, highlight that there are choices that need to be made by policymakers, but I would go one level down and say, practically, this will very much depend on the country context, and I can explain this further. So let me explain what we are doing on the at the World Bank. So the World Bank is a development financier, so our objective, it's actually quite challenging to, <laughs> to talk uh, uh, here, but um, we are a development financier, so our objective is fundamentally development and supporting low and middle income countries in achieving their development objective, and that takes now the form of the SDGs. And there is, as you know, a lot to do because on the SDG side, we haven't done as much progress as we would have liked. At the same time, since 2012, so we have about 10 years of track record, into integrating climate change much more centrally to what we are doing. And this has been a long standing effort, which took, you know, several years to develop. It started by looking at indicators, so looking at projects, the impact on greenhouse gas emissions, for instance, integrating those indicators in all single projects, looking at climate risk. And so we have been evolving or thinking on how we could do better development and climate change. But the real bold change came on July 1st. And we joined other multilateral development banks into integrating development and climate change through what we call Paris Alignment. And Paris Alignment is a new approach that is effective at the World Bank since July 1st. And the idea here is to look at every single of our projects before they are approved for financing, look and assess climate risk, mitigation and adaptation. And then if the risk is too high, change the, the way the project is designed so that we lower the risk on the adaptation side and we lower the risk of carbon lock-in. So that at the end of the day, the project that we are going to, to our board of shareholders for asking for approval, that project is actually climate friendly and is Paris aligned. And we can give the guarantee that it will meet development objectives, but at the same time, help mitigating and adapting objectives. Now, how this is done practically, it's actually very thoroughly done by our project teams. At this point, every single project is screened for climate risk, mitigation and adaptation, and is revised when the risk is too high on the adaptation and mitigation side. So that means 400 of our projects every year, billions of dollars. And project will only be financed if they can demonstrate Paris alignment. So it's actually quite bold. And we are joining other development banks who are going in the same direction. Another major and bold changes and you talked, we talked about indicators here, is we are now starting to shift our emphasis from monitoring climate finance that we are providing towards climate results. And the idea here is that, I saw that you are monitoring greenhouse gas emission in, in your projects, we will go much bolder. Every single of our projects will not only monitor greenhouse gas emission, but we'll also monitor a number of climate impacts for each project. Energy, transport, uh, agriculture, every single project will have a bunch of indicators that are climate indicators. And we hope that all the other multilateral development banks will join us in this effort of not only reporting on climate finance numbers, 
but on the results that we are achieving by financing those projects. So finally, uh, on the question of the who should be involved, it is the responsibility of all of us to be involved. So not only development financiers, but also private sector, uh, countries, of course, civil societies, they have to be part of that discussion on how we can achieve both development and climate objectives at the same time. So let me close here. Thank you very much. Um, I think that's uh, uh, I I understand what the World Bank has has had this similar agony, <laughs> similar uh, difficulty, challenges, but also opportunities. Um, as uh, uh, Jaika uh, is actually um, um, uh, tackling for, well, and I think as as Miyazaki-san mentioned, and I think it's it's a really ex uh, extremely rich experience. Um, it's um, something on. Um, that we, I mean, through through uh, the study for well, the DICA uh, conducted, or of course for well, the World Bank's um, um, practices, advanced practice um, has been well um, uh, taken up as a as a very important reference um, to um, uh, for for their studies. Okay, thank you very much, Nancy. Okay, the next one um, uh, from the um, Pacific Islands perspective. Um, thank you very much, and and again. Um... This has been a. I was going through the um, the questions and thought to myself, um, the approach of co-benefits on on climate change is one that very sensible and one that goes to heart for any Pacific Islander because of um, the impact of climate change that has put on our livelihoods, on our agriculture, on our people, and our, even our identity. The issue of migration is already a, a, a is an issue that has been discussed in the in the Pacific. Um, but let me um, let me come back to the alignment of what we are doing to the approach of co-benefits. And of course, the 2050 strategy for the Blue Pacific is the overarching strategy for the, for the Pacific. And, and with that 2050 strategy comes the uh, Pacific Climate Change Center is contributing and aligning its uh, vision is a center of excellence for climate information, for innovation, for capacity building and knowledge brokerage. So those are the key four functions of the center that is aligned to the 2050 strategy. And the 2050 strategy has mainstream SDGs into that. And that's the guiding document for the Pacific. Um, the question on how the Pacific region and government, um, governments of the Pacific is trying to achieve um, resilience development, um, addressing both climate change and SDGs. Um, you know, in, in the Pacific, it's a different context altogether. Um, and so um, we live with, with the impacts of climate change, um, with, with the impacts of climate change since, I'm, I'm, you know, goes right back. And so I think that resilience in us, you know, is something that um, we always advocate um, for we are resilient, but we need the assistance. We need the benefits of the donors' intervention. We need to ensure that all the interventions that are coming to the Pacific to addressing climate change is impactful, is relevant, is fit for purpose. It's aligning to the priorities of our countries. Now, let me go back to how the Pacific Climate Change Center, in that context, is trying to assist the countries in building resilience development. Um, in 2019, the establishment of the Pacific Climate Change Center in Samoa, which was a uh, bilateral between the government of Japan and government of Samoa to build the Pacific Climate Change Center. The Pacific Climate Change Center is a 100% renewable powered building. And that is displaying leadership in the Pacific in terms of mitigation and of course adaptation. And the Pacific Climate Change Center has got four key themes. One is the low carbon development and, and mitigation. The other is adaptation. The other is um, science to services. And cuts across is climate financing. So in terms of the Pacific Climate Change Center, capacity building, as you mentioned, is one of the key core function of the center because capacity building is something that, is, that needs to be sustained for our people. 
because we do not have the resources and we don't have the manpower and um, the human capacity. So capacity building is something that we really need to sustain. So in 2019, when the establishment of the center came into being, came to with the technical cooperation project by Chaika. And the project was called the Capacity Building for Climate Resilience in the Pacific. And Masako-san and my colleague Yuchi-san looked after that project. Um, in, in terms of that project, um, we've developed courses, 12 executive courses, and these are on key thematic areas. So what this project did, they did a review of the climate policies that are there in the Pacific that are available. And so comes that climate policies were the priorities of key um, capacity building needs of the Pacific. So in 2019 to 2023, we've trained more than 600 participants from the private sector, from NGOs and from government. Um, and you may ask, what is the sustainability and how is, the, is that in, initiative by Chaika is being sustained? We developed, uh, the, this project developed a capacity building sustainability plan. And that is the guiding document for the center in terms of sustainability. You know, as I speak now, there is a cohort of Pacific Islanders. They are called the fellows in, at the University of Melbourne. So what we did, we picked them from the 600 that we've trained through the Chaika project and put them to the University of Melbourne. They will be trained there for six weeks. Um, and so that is the kind of ongoing development that we want um, in terms of ensuring that the initiative by our partners and our donors is sustained through the Pacific Climate Change Center. Um, and, and so um, right now, so we're there in Melbourne. The other one is we also, um, when my colleague Masakusan was there, we also put through a, another project, which was a result of the evaluation of the last project and looking into innovative solutions for climate resilience. And that project will start next year. And we want to utilize the private sector to leverage that support to our countries, for the countries to access innovative solutions. We leverage on that platform, the private sector platform to get the countries to access those innovative solution that is affordable, that is fit for purpose for our countries in the Pacific. I think I will um, end it here. Um, and, and, and so that is the, 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 the kind of intervention that we would like our partners. In terms of the go benefits approach, it needs, we need to ensure that it's impactful and it's sustained. Because one of the key challenges in the Pacific for these projects is very piecemeal. They come in three years. They need to be, we need to look at it from a pragmatic approach. It will have to go beyond the three years. Most of the project that comes to the Pacific is three years. It has that time frame. So uh, what's after that? You know, that's very piecemeal. Um, and, and so I speak from a you know, community perspective. I, I speak from a regional perspective. And that is the key challenge that we are facing in, in the Pacific. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, the um, the strength of the Pacific Islanders, um, you are quite practical. Um, having um, extra challenge, as you said, like the, um, for example, the uh, the lack of resources in terms of human and um, finance, and also like uh, the region is widespread, right? So it's the widest region in the world. However, well, you are actually turning well these challenges into your strength, actually, and I think the um, the center well uh, that was established by um, your government and well JICA, well that is actually demonstrating well the actually the strength of the um, the Pacific Islands approach. Personally, I am actually um I am actually in the negotiation room. I am um, working on um capacity building and uh, negotiation agenda. But I think um, well, this really uh, tells us for well, the, the heart of the capacity um, development cooperation between um, our government and your government and also the engagement of many different stakeholders well, in the Pacific Islands. Yeah. Okay, so having for well, um, um, three rich responses and feedback to uh, uh to JICA's new approach and also the um, the reflection of 
uh, what uh, they have done uh, with JICA. So now uh, it's turn um, um, of Miyazaki-san um, uh, to respond. And also, uh, you may wish to um, uh, further request or further invitation um, to uh, uh, partners for uh, developing uh, country government partners, but also um, uh, work, uh, the other uh, cooperation um, uh, agencies such as the World Bank and others. So you may uh, want to start yep. yeah. responding. Thank you very much. Yeah, first of all, I like to say that the appreciation or that the participation on this session. And so we are very happy to get the, the great input from World Bank, SPREP, and the government of Vietnam. Actually, that uh, this comment and input is very grateful to, uh, to collaborate with our co-benefit approach and also that uh, achieving that uh, somehow that uh, climate resilience development. Maybe that uh, that's kind of that collaboration is very important get together to achieving that uh, at the climate resilience goal. Actually, that the uh, say easy to climate resilience goal. However, that the uh, Hardware is very high. That's why that we have to work together and tackle together to achieve the, the climate resilience goal. That's why this kind of the collaboration is kind of the, the wonderful situation for us. Actually, that the JICA at uh, providing the, some technical cooperation or the, some international collaboration and the cooperation. And the cooperation means that the, not only provided the technology and the finance. Actually, that uh, we also learn a lot from that uh, recipient country, also that uh, wonderful at uh, the partner organization. Actually, this kind of that harmonization is going to be very important to push up more work together to reaching that the climate resilience development. And especially that uh, this occasion at the World Bank, very nice input we get. Actually, that we also that the wondering how to set up that the, at the climate uh, indicator. This is very important issue, and also that we are at the wondering how to at the push up more that the impact finance or something like that. On that sense, maybe that the indicator is going to be very important issue. That's why that we try to at the share that the, our knowledge is and and putting the some up appropriate indicator we are trying to at the set up. And also that the SPREP, <laughs> wonderful <laughs> partner. And we are trying to that the, uh, initiate some other new project. Uh, this project uh, try to uh, promote uh, some innovation, new technology, harmonizing the whole at the 14 country in the Pacific Island. As Kato-san said, 14 is tough, actually. However, that the SPREP at the handling the, the whole together and uh, deliver the, the wonderful information to 14 country and get together and some information and knowledge sharing at the center of the, the SPREP is gonna be very important. That's why that we are happy to at the collaborate with the SPREP and come up with uh, some new idea or innovation to provide at uh, the 14 country and also beyond uh, the Pacific Island. Anyhow, I'm so happy to participate in this meeting. Thank you very much. And Kato-san, a nice at the moderator. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yep. Yeah, uh, please. Yes, yes. Thank you. So on the indicators, as you know, it's it's actually very difficult, uh, and um, but we think that's the way forward to really start thinking in terms of accountability and impact that we are able to quantify exactly through each project that countries are borrowing for how much impact we we really have at the end of the day. So today at the MDB Pavilion, around 5.30, the bank will actually release uh, a discussion paper uh, around this idea of indicators laying out a framework. And so the idea is that we would integrate this more systematically in our projects, 
but also we could imagine uh, having all other multilateral development banks using the same framework so that as financiers, we are able to really report on the impact of financing is really having. Is it a lot? Is it not a lot? Uh, and that's the type of question we want to have answered. Answer. So today uh, we'll be releasing that paper. Sorry, um, just a, a very quick one on um, the outcomes of the first capacity building uh, project that we had. Um, Tonga actually turned that information through one of the capacity building because at the end, the capacity building that we've um, um, we've developed through the Chaika project is actually cut into three modules. So at the end of every uh, uh, training, countries would come up with a concept note. Um, and so Tonga as a, as, a, as a country have turned one of their concept notes and put it into the GCF as a GCF as part of their readiness. Uh, so that is that is one of the, um, the the kind of outcome that verifies that the capacity building and the intervention is relevant and it's contributing to the to the countries. And um, that is the kind of outcome that we would like to encourage through the new technical cooperation uh, by project uh, by by Chaika. And it's not just um, Chaika is also for spread We've also had the um have the um uh, the waste management, uh, which has been a long-standing project assistance by by Chaika as well, um on waste management that's added to um the climate change project on capacity building that um that we have. So I look forward to um having a more discussion on that new project. Um, the fourteen countries, yes, um, and that's but that's why we're here. We are here because we can make make it happen with our countries. Um, so rest assured, um, we will, you know, we will be there to assist, to ensure that your project is delivered um, and reflect on the priorities, add value to the work that we do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, actually, yes, um, the, um, uh, we also, I remember about the discussion with, uh, together with uh, Masako-san and, uh, when she was in Samoa. Uh, that the uh, the center will be uh, more like an incubator of uh, sort of like a ex well that should be hatching towers for the climate finance for example and we're waiting and we, we're also uh, trying to um, uh, work with with that and I think and congratulations for for the second phase uh, are you are you are you taking her again to no, uh, no. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think she she really enjoyed for the um uh, the work for um in in Apia and um um Samoa. But um yeah, I I believe for the this this is actually for the this is the innovation, and uh, that's for the um, Pacific Island countries are um demonstrating. And for I have never seen for this kind of things for um uh, uh before. I think I did, and then also well, this should be also um, a good lessons learned for for other um, uh, uh, countries, well, especially for the uh, extremely vulnerable uh, communities for um, in the world. So I think uh, the uh, well, uh, I really expect for the this uh, the prospect of the uh, second phase of uh, the the project well, um, um in the Pacific um, um climates. Uh, center, and I think uh, uh, this is something where we are also um, 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 learning further uh, in in the in the next activities. Okay, um, having said that, well, um, perhaps well, um, there might be uh, some questions or comments uh, uh, from from the uh, from this room. Um, are there anyone uh, who wants to raise questions uh, to panelists or uh, uh, my colleagues to Jaika? There no, okay, okay. Maybe Mitomori-san, you you may want to um add some some comments. Um, yeah. Or well, he's a he's a he's a, a key figure of uh, uh climate action um um in Jaika. So that I'm I'm very glad for that he's he's taking uh, the mic. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you very much for great uh discussions. Uh, I have a question to 
Dr. Nancy. And uh, as to uh, thank you very much for useful insights, but uh, especially uh, as to the uh, uh, Paris alignment uh, 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 you are uh, pursuing. Uh, one concern is that uh, if you uh, uh, are selecting or the procedure may longer than uh, original schedule. And sometimes you may have difficulties to discussion with the partner countries, developing countries or those things. How, how can you discover or uh, overcome those challenges? Thank you very much. Yes, no, very important question indeed. So far the experience, but you know, we have been four months into the implementation of the Paris alignment approach is that uh, it has been a relatively smooth process uh, in terms of engaging our client countries into this discussion. For our client countries, you know, their objective is a developmental objective and that's what they consider as important. Um, Paris alignments allow some flexibility in, um, you know, in, in some of the difficult discussions, for instance, should the World Bank finance uh, natural gas? Yeah. Um, so far, we have, this discussion has been managed quite well. Uh, we haven't seen any major, um, you know, conflict uh, arising. If anything, this is probably more of a question for NGOs that have been addressed to the World Bank and other development banks. But in terms of client countries, their mindset is very clear. Their objective is a developmental objective, and we have to find a way to reconcile development and climate change. So in terms of delay, so far, none. None. In terms of project teams, the, the it is indeed uh, a new process because there are additional requirements now. They have to demonstrate that they have done the screening of their projects for climate risk, that they have looked at all the options, are proposing the low carbon option in their projects. And if not, they have to justify why it is not the case. So there is a whole exercise of demonstrating to convince that we have done all due diligence on the climate change front and the project that we are proposing to our board for financing is actually the most reasonable that will reconcile development and climate change. Are you are you are you are you happy with the answer? <laughs> well I I I doubt. Well, but uh, uh, I mean, like, uh, I I wouldn't say uh, well, he's happy. Uh, but I think in practice, for well, um, I I have also witnessed for well, um, um, his department. For well, um, he's a uh, is I mean, together with uh, Miyazaki-san and also Mitomori-san, for well, his department actually is trying to um move for the very gigantic um organization of JICA, uh, where well, there are lots of uh, uh, uh um. You know, heavy operations, and for well, they are now mainstream. I mean, really, really, really mainstreaming for well, um climate resilience development into their operations. And then I think well, in 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 um actual practices, for well, there are lots of lots of questions. And um, also, but uh, we also uh, are very happy that for well, there are very positive comments from different departments for well, which are operating with well, the uh, development cooperation. Um, projects. So this is what I have heard from from his uh, office, and for well, that that is actually the the way that JICA is um, um, elevating with well, this um, um, agenda uh, into their um, operations. Well, thank you very much. Um, another question, um, maybe. Well, this is maybe. Well, well, okay, yeah, please, okay. Just maybe to say that we have engaged with you and, and your colleagues on Paris alignment. Um, and to say that this approach is now being adopted not only by all multilateral development banks, but also increasingly by bilateral uh, donors as a way to really demonstrate 
that the financing is actually delivering not only on development, but also on climate. And so I think this approach is increasingly embraced as the way forward. But indeed, in some aspects, it's, it's complex, especially on the energy side. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think well, this is a, um, a good exchange for um, uh, a, a, a among for those who are engaged in the you know actual operation of uh, climate change um, mainstreaming for into their um, development um, cooperation. Okay, maybe well one quick final question. Um, if there are any, are there no? Okay, come on, some please. Yeah. So thank you. Sorry. So thank you so much for your uh, great uh, presentation and also the sharing the experiences on that um, co-benefit approach. So uh, I have the uh, I have the question to uh, Dr. Nancy and also that um, sorry. Uh, Opa. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, so my question is, um, well, uh, in, in the world that um, like IPCC or IP based, um, um, how to say the, uh, uh, said that uh, we need to uh, minimize the trade-offs. So uh, I, um, in principle, we agree to on that, but uh, in, uh, in, in, in practice, uh, we, how to say, we conducted we conduct the like uh, environmental impact assessments or um, something like social um, impact assessments, something like that. So um, I just wondering that uh, um, is it enough to uh, conduct such kind of the impact assessment uh, to minimize the um, uh, trade-offs? This is my question to you. Maybe well, like uh, uh, just to add up uh, um, on his uh, questions. Perhaps well, are there any specific um, steps or procedures or tools uh, that you are you're referred to um, the um, avoidance or minimizing trade off, or or any, for example, like a consultation um, um, uh, happening for well, um, to 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 take for well, those things. Or well, perhaps yeah. Okay. Yeah. So first of all, for the World Bank, uh, our environmental and social safeguard uh, policy do still apply for all our projects. Uh, so that is a given. I think Paris Alignment goes one step further in terms of being intentional about managing the risk and recognizing that there is a risk uh, on the adaptation side and on the mitigation side. And recognizing that you cannot have a zero risk so on the adaptation side, the Paris Alignment approach do allow for an acceptable level of risk. And of course, this is very subjective, expert judgment come in, uh, and that's very, that's very important. We have also the tools to do so. Uh, you talked about tools. Uh, we have a disaster uh, risk and screening tools. So teams have to use those tools to actually assess the risk of their projects, uh, the, the, no, the climate risk uh, on their projects. On the mitigation side, it's also extremely complex. Here, we do not have, per se, the tools yet. And so it's very sector-based. So for instance, on the energy side, all teams have an obligation to look at all the low carbon options that are available and see whether the projects that we are financing is sitting well on that curve. Um, so here you need to do uh, estimates, you need to run models um, that are very sector specific. And that's how you actually can demonstrate that the project that is on the table for consideration is actually the one that is promoting the lower carbon option available and feasible and commercially acceptable. So again, expert judgment comes in, but also objective tools of modeling comes in. Thanks, okay, Alpha, very quickly. Um, for, for SPREP, we are more climate change. Um, that's our mandate. Um, in terms of risk, I just came back from um, Cook Islands 
where we had the leaders forum. And one of the initiative that they put through to the table for discussion um, was the risk facility, uh, finance facility. And so that discussion is ongoing. But in terms of managing risk, um, uh, you are aware of what happened in Tonga, um, the volcanic eruption in Tonga. So we had to shift some of our, um, of, of our people from that particular island to the main island. And one of the questions that they put to us when we went to, um, you know, just to, to, to have that, uh, to talk with that community that had been relocated was, you know, they actually, they are aware of the loss and damage. Um, and so they said, so this is, this is what you call adaptation, you know, having to relocate them and building them the shelter. But they said, so when is, where is adaptation ends and where the loss and damage starts? That is something that I, I, I don't have the answer to that, but that was the kind of question that comes from the community that have experienced that volcanic eruption that happened in Tonga. Uh, and so um, in terms of tool, of course, there are, there are tools that are available. I think the biggest challenge for the countries in the Pacific is how to really utilize those tools. You know, it goes back to capacity, whether we have the technical expertise to really utilize the tools for, you know, managing risks. Um, and, and so that is, that is uh, something that, you know, that has been discussed as part of the ongoing collaboration with CHICA, something that, um, but SPREP doesn't really, SPREP's mandate is on climate change. Um, and not much on, on disaster. Thank you very much. Well, that's a, um, a very interesting uh, point. Um, but today, um, well, um, JCCRS, for well, uh, JICA co-benefit approach to climate change for climate resilience and for well, sustainable development. Now, um, uh, it's, it's in the spotlight and now uh, it is launched. And I, I hope for well, um, all of us here and also that all the uh, developing partners, um, developing countries or develop, developed countries and also developing cooperation agencies, um, 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 multilateral uh, financial institutions such as the World Bank. I think well, this is a new and old and new challenge, but all of us, uh, we cannot uh, do this uh, alone, but all of us needs to um, and join our force. So this is actually what well, the, uh, the the value that we shared, and I think well, this is the strength of JICA. JICA has uh, 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 well the ability to uh, bring more well, people together, and also JICA uh, is the, the uh, has the ability to facilitate well everybody's for well, um uh, strengths for well, um to uh, bring into um uh, the the elevated for well, um actions. So. I hope for well, uh, today's discussion, we're not really ending for well, the uh, the discussion, but I think uh, hopefully uh, this uh, discussion continues. Um, and also we will bring well, this into practice, uh, which is not too easy, but I hope well, um, it is still um, um, exciting and very uh, uh, meaningful. Uh, so with this, um, I would like to invite well, um, all of uh, the um, uh, 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 participants to uh, join me for uh, just to thank uh, 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 our panelists for for their great discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank, you. thank you very much for for the discussion. Thank you very much for the panelists and Mr. Kato for the moder moderation. I would like to ask for Ms. Ogawa to join the the stage so we can take a group photo and it will be all for for today thank you very much
Thank you very much for joining us today at the Japan Pavilion. Uh, we do have also the uh, technology showcase over there. So please take a moment to stop by all these uh, state of art technologies of Japan. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.